So the first question is just relax. <laughs> There's nothing, you know, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and then what's actually surprised me is that um, it's number six. Um, so if you have to pick one below, you think American Chinese food is American food or Chinese food. Mm. There's no, no C answer. <laughs> um, it's purposely there. Um, all my colleagues uh, also, you know, professors, they say, oh, this is hard. This is so <laughs> hard. How do I, like, students don't hesitate at all. The vast majority, about 80%, says American food. Um, that, and for the, all the other answers, um, and uh, I think for the, uh, there's a, a few that actually verify uh, Professor Chen's, uh, you know, the, the book, and I think that is basically common sense for, you know, do you think American Chinese food is home, home cooking or restaurant food? Most people say it is restaurant food. And uh, name a place where you can get Chinese food, uh, 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 American Chinese food, you get a classic of, uh, you know, uh, Beijing buffet, you know, China one is something, and then because there's a Panda Express just re last year open on campus, and so mm. you get that answer a lot, and also get a list of the dishes that, are <laughs> yeah, they think of that basically based on Panda Express ma manual or some other. Um, Chop suey didn't make it. Uh, General Zuo's chicken mm. didn't make it either. Mm. Orange chicken, really, uh, was on, on the fried rice. That's very surprising. Um, and then number seven, okay. Number seven is a question I put more thinking into. Because this basically becomes a very opinionated uh, cultural judgment of what is American Chinese food. So do you think there's a distinction between American Chinese food and real Chinese food? Um, the answers I think about, I, I thought about it, uh, what to put there. Uh, it was uh, put there uh, uh, like purposely, purposefully to be a little bit, um, you know, thought provoking. Or, you know, I leave them a blank to say, you know, to ask them what they think. Surprisingly, um, what do you think would be the, there is one that no one picked, A, B, C, D. Um, which is C. I think that has something to do with who is doing this survey. Because students know who I am. And they know I'm from China. They know I am interested in food culture and this uh, is, uh, you know, planning to offer a class like this. I talk ab about things like this to them. So I think they just do not want to offend me. Or they, they do not know what I think about this, so they usually, uh, the survey is, um, I, I did it in three class. One is advanced Chinese language class. These students, like, um, um, mostly are very interested in Chinese culture in general, and whoever has studied abroad picked A. Um, but uh, all the other, and then the second, I, I, I did a survey in three classes. This is one advanced language class, and um, the other is a, ch a Chinese culture class, and the third is a general edu education class. Students in that class can now tell the difference between Japan, China, <laughs> and Korea, and uh, if you ask them anything, and they, they would put sushi there as a typical, um, you know, Chinese food or something, it's, it's something like this, yes. Uh, there are people like this <laughs> um, in college, uh, in my college, <laughs> in my university. Yeah, and so basically the vote here is an uh, equal divide between uh, A and two B. And A was, you know, mostly, uh, you know, it would uh, tend to be there mostly by Asian, ethnic Asian students or students have visited China and the majority um, and, and then if you balance that off, B has more answer, and then quite a few put E there. Some said, I never had Chinese food, so I do not know. Yeah. Um, what they are saying is basically referring to real Chinese food, and there are only two out of um, my whole three class, which is 40 students said, no, I never had American Chinese food. 
but there are a few said I, I do not know what real Chinese food is because I never had it. Um, um, so basically that is survey that set me thinking so are we basically asserting too much connection between American Chinese food and Chinese culinary culture or uh, is American American food saying more about Americanness of the food or is it saying more about its connection to Chinese food so what is more productive in this comparison, you know, uh, w especially when we teach students about this course, do we start, you know, saying Chinese food culture is this and this, and look at what we have in America here, American Chinese food, in which way is it not real Chinese food? Or should we look at this, okay, American Chinese food, <coughs> um, in which way does, is it American? And what is its connection to the China, the Chinese part of it? So that really made me think a, a little bit whether you know we can just say because it's American Chinese food and then it, we have to measure it against Chinese food. Or maybe they just assume this is something they grew up with, they eat, and for them it is just American <coughs> thing. Um, whether how, how much it has, you know, the has to do with real Chinese food, if there's such a thing, you know, on the other side of the world, may not be the concern. This may not, you know, my students, especially in the China education class, may not be the most, uh, you know, educated in culture, in, in the food culture, especially in China, but then, um, what they reflect may be, um, you know, just inspiring in its, its own way. And also, last of all, I suspect the result of this survey really has something to do with who is doing it. Next time I will think about um, offering, if I really pass the human subject research and develop into a real uh, questionnaire to do it in a pure science class, uh, given by, you know, just any other professor, see whether the result will be different. I suspect, I, I, I strongly feel that there will be a difference just based on the audience because I, I <coughs> do believe food discussion, especially ethnic food discussion in the US is basically a cultural statement. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, that's good. Uh, great, uh, very uh, inspiring uh, to me and uh, I guess to the audience as well. Uh, again, uh, thanks for the invitation and also the nice uh, introduction to the panel and I'm honored to uh, join this panel to talk about American Chinese food, but except that I wrote this book on the history of chopsticks, I can't claim that I'm uh, an as an expert as Yong Chen, he has done a couple, maybe even more books on, on the subject. Uh, to answer the questions, what, what is uh, American Chinese food? I, that's my personal reflection. I would say they should be different from Chinese food in, in, in America. So my uh, response to this question would be that uh, we may have three kinds of uh, Chinese food. Uh, prepared and uh, served in, in America. One, the first one is uh, Chinese food in America mostly found in Chinatowns. That uh, they may have some uh, local ingredients like broccoli, which is not very common in China, and even lettuce, uh, which is not very common as a vegetable in, in, in China, using Chinese food. But in general, the food is prepared in those restaurants in Chinatowns, the same way as they would have been prepared in China, despite the local uh, differences, because we know that uh, there are maybe eight schools of uh, uh, Chinese uh, cooking traditions or cul uh, culinary traditions. Despite the regional differences, but uh, most of the food will be, will, will be cooked the same way, except some uh, newly added ingredients. Then the second type of food is, uh, I would call uh, them as American Chinese food, 
which were mostly found in restaurants in the suburbs and also in the takeout or takeaway places. And they, uh, they have some special dishes like General Zoss chicken, which is total in, uh, an invasion, uh, uh, in invention in America, as well as like sweet sour chicken or sweet sour uh, beef or pork, and also egg bouillon. And of course, the, the earlier form would be uh, the chop suey, right? Uh, chop suey as well. But even though chop suey could be uh, also found in the uh, Guangdong area in China before. And I think uh, this type of food was essentially, I don't know whether you have worked in, the, in those restaurants, and I did, not, not very long time, but <laughs> usually those Chinese food are prepared with only two sauces, one brown sauce, sometimes added with some uh, 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 peppers to make it slightly uh, spicy. So brown sauce mixed with, uh, you know, cornstarch and also mainly the soy sauce because it's brown. Right? The second sauce is uh, is so-called white sauce. It's basically just uh, some oil and uh, and also the uh, cornstarch and so on. So no matter what ingredient, the chef or the cook will basically cook the food and then will pour in the sauces. So if if you say it's a uh, brown sauce like uh, sweet sour, they add a little bit of uh, sweet uh, uh, ingredients to that, so make it. So it's, uh, it's a very easy way or also a creative way to serve Chinese food fast. So that's another form of almost like a, a fast food uh, in, uh, of uh, 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 the uh, Chinese food. There's a third version which I think started possibly in the 1990s, which can be called like a Chinese fusion food, or whether we should be fusion Chinese food or fusion a uh, Asian food. That was uh, more diversified, and that were mixed with uh, not just the local ingredients that found in, in, in America, but you also found this menu, you can see more creative ways of uh, blending uh, cook uh, culinary traditions from other uh, Asian countries like Singapore, like uh, uh, Malaysia, and so on. So even so, the customs going there would uh, have uh, different types of food that uh, cannot be found actually in China, nor found in those suburban uh, Chinese restaurants. So these are the three types of uh, American food that, uh, or American Chinese food that I think. And then, well, I have to use some of the examples that are in my research on the history of chopsticks. These three types of Chinese food were also distinguished by the utensils they use, in particular whether they serve chopsticks or not. And in, I would say increasingly of course, even in the Chinese uh, restaurants in the suburban areas, you possibly would be provided the chopsticks. But I would say 10 years ago was not the case. The waitress or waiters would it possibly have a bunch of chopsticks in their apron, ready to be given to the customers upon their request. Otherwise, you can only find the Western cutlery on the table. So that's, but on the other hand, if you eat Chinese uh, food in Chinatowns and, and uh, more like, uh, I would say, uh, in urban areas, then sometimes you, you can only find chopsticks. They, so the case was like a totally the opposite. That if you want to use forks and knives, you have to ask, can I have a fork or knife? But some of the Western customers or the non-Chinese American customers would be too shy to, to ask. So they would uh, try to use chopsticks, and which was is, you know, exactly the purpose because for many Chinese uh, uh, restaurant owners in Chinatowns, they thought that this is uh, one of the uh, more intimate or more authentic experience in eating Chinese food. But again, I would say as early as the 1980s, or even, even uh, maybe uh, late 1970s, then due to the invention of uh, uh, disposable chopsticks in Japan, then it became more popular. Even in those uh, fusion Chinese uh, restaurants, as well as the Chinese restaurants in Chinatowns, then most cases that they are not going to provide you those reusable chopsticks. They will give you only uh, uh, the, 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 the disposable ones, one-time use chopsticks. 
But then, in terms of one time use chops, then you have two different kinds. One is a Japanese kind that the, the end was connected, then you have to split open. That's one kind of thing. Then the other one was like a, usually in, in putting in red sleeves, that's the Chinese ones that you don't need to split. So these two, two different kinds. And then that's how uh, I would say the three types of Chinese food were uh, uh, distinguished. And, but there's also commonalities among the three. The commonality is that uh, in all those Chinese f uh, uh, restaurants, usually, more than often, you will be provided a fortune cookies mm -hmm. after your meal, which is now, of course, found in China, in any restaurants in China. But increasingly, as uh, you go to a Chinese restaurant in Chinatowns, they are going to adopt the Chinese way that is not give you fortune cookies. They will give you oranges instead, or sometimes the Cantonese restaurants uh, in Chinatowns would possibly give you uh, a, a bowl of sweet, like a soup, uh, as a kind of dessert, uh, in, you know, in place of uh, uh, fortune cookies. But then, of course, I have to point out one caveat. The caveat is that despite the differences, uh, there are also a good deal of overlap in the three types of Chinese food. So that is, their distinction is not aligned in the same. So you will have a lot of overlaps. And uh, American Chinese food changed over time, I would say, definitely. Uh, we were, of course, fascinated with uh, Yong Chen's book's title, of course, the chop suey, but uh, increasingly the, the, the trend that I found is that chop suey is disappearing from, <laughs> from the menus <laughs> in, uh, in Chinese restaurants. Not just in Chinese restaurants in Chinatown, but also in <coughs> what I define as the American Chinese food. And then you don't find chop suey. But the chop suey, you can possibly, if you order, you can still do it because chop suey is such an easy dish to cook. Usually you have the, the, the dry noodles at the bottom, then you mix. Because chop suey itself means really a mixed uh, kind of uh, uh, different kind of ingredients. I'm not an expert, but I know that uh, you, know, you put in some meat, put in some uh, vegetables, you cook them together, and then place the on the dry noodles to serve. Uh, but of course, the uh, chop suey was a very uh, primary form of Chinese food. Uh, serving not only in Chinatown, but that was mo mostly before the Second World War. So it was that in, in terms of the development of Chinese food in America, the Second World War uh, would be considered a turning point. Then after the Second World War, then particularly after the 70s, through the 60s, uh, then in the 70s, then you have these three types of possibly uh, Chinese restaurant development in America. But on the end, uh, Another trend which I observed was the increasing popularity of uh, Chinese buffets, which in a way also killed a lot of uh, regional differences or the culinary differences in cooking <coughs> Chinese food, which is not necessarily a good trend. Nevertheless, it is very uh, popular trend that's serving the need of American customers. And uh, they also, of course, mixed with Chinese food uh, with, uh, of, of other uh, Asian uh, food like uh, sushi, and also as well as the steaks and the hams, french fries, and, uh, and, and without any exception, then you will be served with uh, uh, ice cream if you want, right? So those Chinese buffet places, definitely you have a, a, a bunch of uh, non-Chinese food will also serve you because, again, to tailor to the interest, to the, to the di diverse interest of uh, the customers. Regional different, uh, regional variants in American Chinese food. I guess there, there are some. But at least <coughs> in, if uh, if we only talk about the American Chinese food in America in the suburban restaurants, then I would say <coughs> not a great deal of uh, variant. You st you will always find general sauce chicken. Even the sauce can be uh, uh, spelled differently. <laughs> that can be general Lee's chicken, general Zhang's chicken. <laughs> Or the Zhou can be the TSO, can be TZO. And of course, I, I, I don't know whether you have read uh, General Eight Lee's book, Fortune Cookie Chronicle, and uh, she did some research uh, on the origin of the fortune cookies. And I don't want to spend time on that, but uh, if you want me to talk about it, then I can rehearse <laughs> what she found. Yeah, that was basically somewhat traced to uh, a Japanese food in Kyoto. It's, it's like a sweet, and they put in those. Uh, 
uh, those uh, fortune slips, fake fortune slips inside the cookies and so on. And then I think uh, when, when people are saying that it's because the Japanese were interned through into internal uh, camps uh, during the Second World War, then, then, then the Chinese chefs uh, uh, pick up, but there's also some dispute on that. The Chinese will say that, no, we are not just imitators, we are also creative and so on. So this is another, some kind of controversy. And does the meaning of American Chinese food depend on the identity of its customers? Yes, I, I think it all depends on the customers they serve. So sometimes it's not like a pleasant experience for non-Chinese customers to go to a Chinese restaurant and they found that actually the Chinese customs would be uh, provide another menu, right? And so you have those restaurants that are located, you know, like I usually go to uh, Chinatown in Philadelphia, then, and they will have uh, sort of like a standard American Chinese food menu where you can find general toast chicken, sweet sour chicken, and so on. On the other hand, uh, they would possibly give you another uh, menu. Sometimes I will ask, say, uh, do you have a Ch Chinese kind of menu, only written in Chinese. But that, that, that is not so common anymore. It's, it's disappearing because you have more and more non-Chinese customers also want the same. Uh, they call it, or they consider it authentic Chinese food. What's the relationship between Chinese cookery in America and the food of Great China? And I would say American Chinese food became more and more diversified. The example, of course, is the one that I mentioned, the, the, the Asian fusion restaurant. It became more and more popular, not only in Chinatown, but as well as in suburban areas. And they have spiked more interest in Asian food in general. And then by contrast, I was in Great China, or particularly in China in particular. Um, the trend has gone to a direct, uh, I would say, the, almost like a direct opposite direction. And due to the popularity of the food that found in Yongchen's uh, uh, home province, Sichuan, and the spicy food. <laughs> and then uh, this popularity of a spicy Sichuan and a Hunan food have really taken over. It's become a new love for almost all the Chinese. I grew up in Shanghai, in Jiangnan area, and the, the traditional food, of course, was not spicy at all. And now, of course, the Shandong food was not spicy at all. But in Beijing, of course, the Yan Thai, uh, the, the, the Beijing food was not supposed to be spicy. But of course, in those restaurants, even in, 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 in Beijing, you have a, a very famous Cantonese restaurant called the Shenfeng, very expensive and so on. But even in Shenfeng, you can find a lot of spicy. So I would say the Chinese food in China became more unitary. On the other hand, then in America, uh, Chinese food, whether you were found in, in Chinatown as well as in suburban uh, areas, and uh, the trend became more diversified. And what's the relationship between um, politics? I should give this uh, quite a bit of thought. But in general, I would say food is a very good way to uh, unite people. Even we don't like people from that region, but uh, we don't mind uh, tasting the food. One example that I can find is that uh, I've been to Europe uh, many times, and uh, even 10 years ago, or five years ago, and so on, when I go to Germany, and we know that uh, many Germans, uh, they not like people from, say, Turkey or the Middle East. Uh, and, but on the other hand, you can see kebabs almost at every corner of the street. So that means the popularity of kebab or the Middle Eastern food is there to stay. Even though if the, 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 the tension between the Germans and the immigrants are, are growing, but the food is there. And then in, Chan, in, in terms of uh, relationship between Chinese food in America as well as uh, uh, politics in China, then I would say maybe 10 years ago and some people said about uh, in Monterey Park in Los Angeles, uh, at those Chinese restaurants attracted best chefs from China. And they said that, that way, if you want to find the best Chinese food, then you don't go to China, but you go to uh, actually Los Angeles because they were able to attract many chefs. But I guess this uh, policy could be, or this trend could be stopped because of the new uh, immigration policy introduced by the Trump administration. So that's just one, one you know, example that I uh, think of. 
but in, in, in general, I don't think politics will play a major role in changing people's perception of the food. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> so I would like to invite uh, our other two panelists to respond, um, and then we can move forward. <laughs> I, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank you all for, for being here. I, I would like to uh, thank um, Professor Brown and Professor Lam for inviting me. Uh, I'm so excited and honored to be here for many, many reasons. Uh, one of them, one of the reasons I'm very happy to be here is actually the snow. Uh, <laughs> I haven't, uh, uh, which I haven't seen in, in a few years. You know. no. I spent six years uh, at Cornell. For those, those of you who have been to upstate New York, you know how beautiful, how pure it could be in winter time. Yeah, another of, of course is the great topic, okay. uh, food. So let me uh, maybe uh, start by, uh, uh, by putting uh, my thoughts and the, the wonderful comments uh, in a larger context. Uh, um, I'll do so by, uh, by uh, sharing a question that I've been thinking about uh, for maybe more than 20 years, uh, which shows how old I am, um, and, um, which is, uh, you know, why study food? You know, we know food as a topic has become, uh, uh, it's becoming increasingly popular, you know, uh, involving um, uh, scholars, uh, investors, uh, diner, I mean, uh, diners, uh, uh, connoisseurs in, in a wide range of fields, uh, anthropology, science, uh, medicine, public health, uh, even national security, you know, and so on and so forth. Okay, so, so, so um, you know, why we study food and, and, and how, okay, the, uh, and It'll take more than one day to answer that uh, that question because it took me more than 20 years to, to think about it and I have no clue yet uh, how to a a answer that, uh, uh, that question. So that brings me to the second question, w which is, uh, you know, why we study Chinese food and how. Okay. And, and um, I came to those questions because uh, uh, of the wonderful prompts that I, that I got from Professor Brown. Okay. Uh, I think it, it depends on the audience. Uh, you know, I've, I've been uh, giving talks on food uh, uh, um, in various parts of, of the country and the globe uh, to different audiences. Right? So, uh, my uh, uh, the topics and the content of my uh, comments uh, talks uh, uh, vary, you know, uh, depending on the nature of the audience. You know, if they are uh, with, uh, if they are scientists, you know, there will be a s different set of questions. If they are investors or if they are students, or uh, scholars, and and uh, diners. You know, there, uh, culinary uh, tourism is now also a growing field, right? I do get invited to talk to those people. You know, you get paid and you get uh, a free meal <laughs> for attending a meal, and you have to speak only for five minutes, right? <laughs> uh, so, um, why Chinese food? I think, uh, 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 first of all, I think ha it has it's because it has become part of uh, Americana. Okay, I did a, a museum exhibit entitled "What." To uh, entitled uh, 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 "Have you eaten yet?" Okay, <laughs> which is a loaded uh, um, expression, actually. Uh, in, uh, wait, uh, back in in New York and then in Philadelphia uh, more than ten years ago, and I'm now involved in a uh, uh, another mu museum show. Uh, I'm not at uh, this time. I'm not a, a, curi a curator. The, the show I is in the Museum of uh, Food and Drink in Brooklyn. Uh, right now, it's called Chow. Which also has a cooking component attached to uh, uh, to it. Okay, so um, it uh, uh, according to this show, you know there are over fifty thousand Chinese restaurants, right? So when you say it's Chinese, uh, it's you know nothing is more American than American Chinese food, right? So that brings me back to the very que first question, a uh, prompt that Professor Brown asked mm -hmm. us to to think about. Okay. Um, and that's one way to study Chinese food, you know, to talk about uh, the authenticity of Chinese food, you know, whether uh, of the Chinese food in the U.S., whether it is Chinese or whether it is American. And then, in, you know, uh, um, another question comes up. You know, why that question? Uh, who cares? Or who cares? Right? Um, a lot of people cared, and, and there are many... Uh, 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 reasons uh, why um, 
why people care. Okay. Um, uh, the uh, I I'm fascinated by by the survey. Actually, yeah. The uh, um, the it, it's a fascinating question in, in part because there's no ready answer. Okay, and uh, uh, thi this is in part because um, a cuisine is not a uh, 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 a fixed constant reality. It, it is a process. As someone who's uh, uh, as a scholar who studied the um, who studied Chinese food in uh, in the Song Dynasty uh, back in the 1970s uh, pointed out uh, 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 that there are, uh, one one of the three elements for the formation uh, uh, of a cuisine is uh, um, active interactions with uh, other cuisines. So, y so y in other words, you know, if uh, you know, a, a cuisine cannot become one, you know, without I interacting with others, with other cultures, and when you do so, you change. Mm -hmm. You constantly acquire new elements. Okay, so, I, so I, I'm gonna stop uh, here, and we'll come back to some of the other uh, issues that, that uh, they have uh, touched upon. Hi, I'm Carolyn. Uh, thank you again for inviting us. Again, snow, lovely, from California. <laughs> um, I guess my question is really, what are we talking about here? Uh, Chinese American food. Are we talking about contemporary Chinese American food? Or are we talking about it historically? Because it's been in the United States since the gold rush. Um, it was brought over mainly by coastal Cantonese uh, to the United States, and they wanted to eat the foods of their homeland. And what they ended up with is something that was much more healthy than what the uh, white uh, miners were eating. They were basically eating meat and drinking whiskey, and uh, they were dying off at very fast rates, you know. But the Chinese were very healthy. They were actually building the railroads and digging the, the gold and staying extremely healthy. And a lot of Americans were looking like, why are these people so healthy? So what happened was that food began to be introduced to the United States from China by people mainly from the Toysan area. And it was uh, basically rice and vegetables, because that's what they could afford. And so when we start talking about Chinese American food, we have to realize that it had a very uh, historical basis, at least in California. Uh, yeah. And so um, our people in, in California, they, these Chinese Americans, began to open up restaurants. And it was, they also were serving to clientele at a very early stage, because you had the white people that would demand one thing. And my relatives still pretty much demand the same, same thing. My uncle, when we'd go out for Chinese food, he wanted uh, pork chops and french fries, you know. And so that was his concept of Chinese food. Which was, he looked at me and goes, yeah, no tofu, right? But um, and the Chinese then would have more, quote unquote, authentic uh, Chinese food. And that has really pretty much continued up to uh, contem uh, contemporary times, as like you were saying, the double menus, like I always have uh, my uh, non-Chinese friends say, what are all those things on the wall and why is everybody eating better than we are, you know? So this is, again, if there's an evolution and we have to really decide on what are we talking about here? What is Chinese American food? Are we talking about something that's historic or are we talking about something that is only concerned with today? Because these are two vastly different things. Uh, they're almost 160 years going on here as it's evolved. And so um, then we need to talk about what are we talking about with Chinese food? Because I don't like the word Chinese food as much as I like to say the foods of China. Because China is as, as large and as diverse as Europe. It has as many different cultures. Uh, it, is, uh, it has a much longer history than Europe. And so things have evolved and changed in China. And when you go through the various areas of China, you will see there, there is just as distinct and as unique as going from Scandinavia to Greece and over to Spain. So uh, I would encourage you in, in to think also, uh, we, ha we continually talk about the eight cuisines in China, but it's more than that. Those are eight major um, like banquet style cuisines in China. But China is, again, much more than just simply uh, uh, Sichuan, Hunan, uh, and uh, Beijing and so forth. The whole west part of China is ignored. Uh, Tibet and Mongolia are ignored. Uh, Manchuria, Taiwan, Fujian, all these different places have these marvelous and unique cuisines. You go into a place like Guangdong province and 
Guangdong encompasses not only the, the, the classic foods of Guangzhou, the capital, but you have uh, the foods of the, the Pearl River Delta, you have the Hakka people, uh, you have Chaozhou, which is on the northern border next to Fujian, which is extremely exciting uh, food. So again, it's all, I, what I'd like to, give, to do, uh, what I would like to do as we talk uh, today is to define what it is we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Because I think then if we limit the scope and understand what we're talking about, we'll all be on the same page. It's all mm -hmm. speaking the same language. So um, when I think about Chinese American food, I'll just be really quick here because I think there's a lot to talk about here. But my idea of Chinese American food is, ed is, is culturally uh, a, a fusion food. And it is just as important as Tex-Mex or Italian red. <coughs> and Tex-Mex is not Mexican food. Its food is, is interpreted by Texans or uh, people in the Southwest. Italian red is not classic Sicilian food. It is food that is, was interpreted for Americans, especially in um, the East Coast, up in uh, Brooklyn or uh, in, uh, in uh, New York. And so like when I was talking to Marcella Hazan about Italian food, and she said one of the first things she said to me was, we don't have spaghetti and meatballs in Italy. <laughs> and she was like, we serve the spaghetti first, that's the prima parte, and then we have the, the prima parte, and we have the meatballs second. We don't put them together, that's what you stupid Americans do. And so, <laughs> so we have this, but we Americans like our spaghetti and meatballs. And that is, we've got Chef Boyardee now. And just like we have uh, canned Chinese food when I was growing up, we had, uh, uh, chow mein in cans, and to me that was a really wonderful thing to eat. You know, it was a great you know variety from meatloaf and tuna roll casserole, you know, tuna casserole. So, um, I to me, I I have a really warm place in my heart for traditional uh, uh, Chinese American food. Uh, and I went to the University of Hawaii, and one thing that struck me there was how much Chinese Chinese uh, style foods had been incorporated into the local cuisine. It was, they were no longer separate. You had long rice, uh, you had uh, the char shell, the, uh, the sweet roast pork. Um, all these things were incorporated into the, the local food. And so it was no longer separate. It was became Hawaiian local food. And uh, I see that beginning to happen today. You, you read things like Lucky Peach, or uh, you, go, you go online and you, you talk about uh, contemporary influences on American food. So many chefs now are, in, are including things from China, China's tradition, traditional culinary uh, scope. They don't really understand what they're doing, uh, to, especially to a Chinese scholar. They don't speak Chinese. They've never been to China. But they admire certain things, and they're beginning to bring it in. So that is something else that is happening. It's, this is all evolving as our foods become more and more in touch with each other. And again, in China, it's the same thing. You'll see American and Western and European foods being adopted and incorporated. And is there a complete understanding? Not necessarily, but it's the first step. We're all taking baby steps into these opposite directions. So that's what I, I really like to talk about that as well, how our cultures are influencing each other and making them better. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. So I guess uh, we would like to open the floor to questions from the audience and you know, to invite you into a conversation um, before our distinguished panelists. Don't talk at once. Yes. Raise your hands. <laughs> yeah, so three dialogue. Come on. Um, uh, I think comment about uh, about Germany, specifically about the, the you know everybody likes kebab. You know, there's a lot of tension. That intrigues me because um, I'm wondering if if uh, and maybe this would require research. People who are drawn different cultural foods may have characteristics of having a more openness to that culture. So I'm wondering if not everybody in Germany is eating kebabs, but it's people who are particularly more open to the immigrants and to the cultural and even, you know, conceiving the immigrants. So I, I would think the same thing applies in terms of Chinese or any other kind of um, um, different cultural food that does reflect, and you're making these comments out, more receptivity to that people as well. I would be hard pressed to find, let's say, somebody who had um, uh, prejudiced views about a people but was 
fully willing to eat their foods all the time. <laughs> I mean, true. I mean, I, I guess we should do a survey like uh, what uh, Yen was doing that uh, <laughs> among the Germans. How do they think about uh, kebabs and other other Middle Eastern food? Then we can we, we can talk more. The the thing that uh, strikes me is is really the popularity. Maybe the maybe the price and uh, and so on. But uh, I guess uh, immigrants from Turkey or from Middle East still a minority in terms of percentage in the population. But if you look at the, uh, the I would say, the, the accessibility of those foods on the German city streets, I guess that uh, definitely has some appeal. I mean, I, but I, yeah, I agree with you that uh, if somebody is not really into a certain culture then that person may not be interested in even trying the food there. But on the other hand, as I said, many, uh, I think that anthropologists and, and found out uh, food is the best way of uh, the cultural communication or cross-cultural communication. Yeah. Could I re uh, respond to that fascinating question? Can you love the food of someone that you hate? Um, the, it, it's, um, um, it's a fascinating question because um, um, it's a complicated one. Okay, I think at one level you can say no. Okay, you know you don't love, uh, uh, you don't, you would not want to eat uh, the food of someone that you hate. Okay, or you dislike, you despise. Okay, um, on the other hand, um, it takes um, a long time to. Uh, uh, besides a few tastes, you know, most of our tastes are, 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 are acquired. Okay, uh, you know, I except for for sweetness, you know, uh, uh, right? You know, our taste for coffee, for uh, for, for example, it's uh, it's very much uh, a required taste, uh, as is the, uh, the taste for Chinese food, American or Ch or China. Um, so the um, you know, when you think of uh, Americans in China. Right, who loved the Chinese people, the missionaries, right, who claimed to love Ch the Chinese people at least. Right? And it took a long, long time for them to learn to like Chinese food even a little bit. Many of them have you know, stayed with the Western uh, ways of eating for a long, long time. You know, they, they, they trained their Chinese uh, cooks to how to cook Chinese food. Okay? Uh, another I example to demonstrate uh, the complexity of that question uh, is um, uh, the working class in the U.S. Okay, uh, there are there are uh, three major groups. Okay, who became uh, the main uh, the main uh, um, uh, supporters, okay, customers in Chinese restaurants. One of which is uh, the working class, and we also know that the working class is uh, the backbone of the uh, the powerful. Uh, Nationwide anti-Chinese uh, movement. Okay, so it's a very it's a very complex uh, question that that deserves uh, further con consideration. But thank you for the question. Anyway. Um, um, I would like to um, respond to that question because I married a German. That's why I regularly <laughs> spend, <laughs> spend I spend like my summer months like every other year in Berlin, and Duna like uh, the, the turkey, just a little food stand. And my favorite, you guess I do not have, I'm pretty neutral to the ethnic situation uh, in Germany and the world, all these groups. I ate it just because it is convenient, and it's affordable, and uh, at every street corner is a nice combination of like uh, meat and uh, vegetable and everything. And so, um, like, uh, so do many Germans like it that way. Uh, because it is accessible, it is where you want it and where you need it, and you just grab it and take it to go. And I ate duna more often than I ate Chinese, either the German, that's, is there such a word, Germanized, or whatever, the European style, ch 
Chinese lo local Chinese food or the the real Chinese restaurant Chinese food. It doesn't mean I love um, you know uh, uh, other people are uh, you know people more than the Chinese and that's. I, I do not think food is a statement in that way. I think it is the other way. Food is food. When you really, really love food, of a group of people, you start to grow cur curious, or maybe you start to kind of join to that. Because we are just like, for example, if you're hungry on the street, and then all these are the dining, dine in places, German, you know places, ice bun, not just like large place like this. And then there, it, you just want to grab something and go to the park or go somewhere. And it's a necessity. I think it's because that group of people, um, they are willing to work hard. And they come with a certain food culture, and which, is, which hit, the target, hit the market well. And uh, it's, it's just become popular because it fulfills a certain need. And uh, I would say, if I'm really hungry, it doesn't really matter who I love and who I hate, as long as the food is good. Yeah, <laughs> why not? I mean, this, <laughs> I, I do not really think food is really, you know, when you just take a bite of good food, it's that political or anyway. It is just, we are just, that is a biological nature. You just. I was And you actually now, now I think that uh, in terms of, of, of course, Yong Chun is an expert on that, but I, in, in terms of the early experience of Chinese living in the United States, definitely, the food they ate became a symbol for discrimination, for social contempt, because they have this kind of widespread notion which was actually uh, wrong, not correct, saying that the Chinese eat rats, right, and uh, the Chinese food are not uh, 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 Sanitary and so on, but that 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 is a definite way as almost like a, a marker for being a subhuman or being like a less civilized. So in in that way, definitely, food can be politicized as well. I have a question <coughs> off this uh, political level, and I would like to bring the. Uh, talking about the Chinese food. <laughs> and uh, food, food culture, so I think that's a, I call it <coughs> also the culture of uh, our palates. And uh, when we taste the food, we call this the Chinese food. That's the Italian food, that's the Spanish food, or American food, or Texas food. Your palate is very sensitive to figure out the difference of the food. But how can you identify this is the Chinese food? And even that does a, the Chinese food become a fusion Chinese food, but you still call it Chinese food. Why? Because of the soy sauce? <laughs> because of the uh, MSG, <laughs> and I, I, I should say MSG is not from China. <laughs> <laughs> That's invented by Japanese. Yeah. 
<laughs> they sold the, the uh, they sold the lots of the MSG at the beginning. Every package has a coin, real money. So they sell the MSG to China like this one. Mm -hmm. So use the money to open the gate of a China's uh, uh, culinary uh, industry. And then now, we just left the one thing. Do you think Chinese food is equal with the soy sauce? Or with the chili sauce? What's the, what's the difference between the Chinese uh, chili sauce and the, the, the Western chili sauce or a Mexican chili sauce? Mm -hmm. what's, what is the Chinese food? When you taste it, you can tell. That's my question. There are so many complicated questions. <laughs> uh, here is another one. How to define the term cuisine? Yeah. And uh, you know, when I teach a food class every every year, and I spend a week uh, doing that without achieving anything. Um, so it's uh, uh, but you, you know, uh, so many elements: uh, uh, cooking utensils, um, uh, a season, uh, seasoning, and which is a big part of it. Uh, uh, staple foods, uh, signature dishes, and so on and so forth. But there's also um, a measure of um, of subjectivity, uh, wh which is uh, whether it's been recognized as such, right? So, so, so that brings me back to the issue of, uh, you know, what is Chinese food and how that's been demonstrated and who has authority to uh, to define that. And there are many ways of, of doing that. And um, you know, uh, I remember the ways in which uh, uh, a restaurant, the owner of a Chinese restaurant in, in New York City, did it uh, because I was part of it. You know, uh, I used, used uh, I meant this is a few years, quite a few year, years ago when I was doing New York, uh, research in New York City. So I kept going to that, to that uh, Chinese restaurant in a non-Chinese uh, neighborhood. You know, every time I, I went there, uh, the owner put me at the table by the window, every time. <laughs> so uh, uh, until I realized that I became the, uh, the symbol of uh, authenticity. Uh -huh. of authenticity. <laughs> My mom used to tell me they yeah, would go into I a mean, Chinese restaurant if there were Chinese people. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, so. I, I actually agree with uh, Mr. Huang's uh, uh, observation because I, I can add one footnote because I have uh, two friends that are a couple and one time they drove across America from the East Coast to the West Coast. Of course, for like uh, one week or more, for 10 days and so on. They, what they told me is that, uh, first of all, one thing, they say that we can find Chinese food in every town, no matter how small it is. But the second thing they found, which actually helps to strengthen your argument, is that uh, they, on the road, being grown up in China and so on, on the road they have tried some American fast food, or McDonald's, or Burger Kings, and so on. But after like, a few days, they said they, the first thing they arrived in one town, the first thing is they want to find a Chinese restaurant. Even though, of course, According to my definition, the Chinese restaurant they found in the small towns across the country would be not so authentic Chinese food. But they still like that. That's because that's really suit their, what you said, the palates, right? So, oh. so may I, uh, my, my mother went to Spain for a month one year and they went driving a crowd. She was Cantonese. Um, so, and I remember that every single day she went to some Chinese restaurant that was, you know, catering obviously to Spaniards. Um, but it was because of the, uh, it was rice. So mm -hmm. you were supposed to avoid the staple food, right? Which, mm -hmm. So she, she didn't mind that the flavoring was wrong or that mm -hmm. it had been changed, but she had to have her rice. Otherwise, she would feel hungry. And so I guess there's an element of just the staple, you know, and, and it's the ingredients, not even so much getting the right flavor as much as making sure you have the right thing in your mouth. Mm -hmm. Okay, and is there a, uh, yeah, the, and then the I yellow. I think um, the question about the soy sauce and what's the difference
very healthy. So I think the the soil soil salt and the soil um, the hot salt will taste very good because the soil. Mm -hmm. And also I like to um, agree with the Carolyn. I'm from Taiwan and mm -hmm. I've been here for 40 some years. I'm a cooking instructor for mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Computers Institute. Mm -hmm. And uh, I associate with uh, um, people from Taiwan and I was the our cooking right now, almost Asian fusion and every dish that we are making. Like my most popular dishes I also publish on another newspaper is a cashew chicken, you know, with hot sauce. But this this is original from Gumball TV, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, now I entertain my American friend always that the dishes that I'm not going to do Gumball TV, I always go catch the chicken. And I also have demonstrated this for other jobs that are unfair for many, many years. And also my tofu dish, again, I have the tofu dish original from um, Pidang tofu, right? <laughs> but I'm not going to so my American friend with this thousand black egg with the tofu, right? That's why I modify, become very um, beautiful uh, tofu dishes. Mm -hmm. And my American friends love that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it almost an Asian food. Yeah, you do. Uh, I have a question. I, I thought I remember reading somewhere in the past that the fortune cookie machine was uh, invented in like San Francisco, yeah. Chinatown. Is, does that have any truth to it? No, not, not Chinatown. According to uh, Jennifer Lee's research, well, not Chinatown, in the uh, uh, gar garden, some kind of a uh, park, uh, which is uh, it's, uh, it's an exhibit for Japanese culture and so on. This is how the, 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 the family, Hakiwara, I think, say that they invented it. And they also show the machine. And when when there was kind of uh, some kind of a lawsuit going on and so on, so it, this this is not but on the end the way that we see today, I think it has more to do with uh, the Chinese uh, creation or invention because the Japanese uh, uh, the, those cakes that having uh, has this uh, vague fortune inside it was not the same shape. It's not maybe even baked. It was more possible like uh, steam. The, the, other, the other thing talking about what is essential Chinese food, I think besides the staple food, the rice to me I think is one element which is very important, but on the other hand you also have, have like Indians, they, they eat rice, the Southeast Asians, they eat rice. So I think we also need to consider one important cooking style, mm -hmm. which was not actually the, 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 the oldest cooking style in China, which is stir frying. Stir frying was not happening until the third century and so on. Once, because the first century, uh, AD, then the, 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 this uh, the stone mill or stone grinding like um, grain into like uh, flour became very popular, became widely accepted. And at the same time, they also grind like uh, 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 seeds into oil. So once you have that, then then you that really prepare the way to cook a stir fry food. You can heat the oil and uh, cut the, the 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 food into small biteable uh, size and cook them very quickly. And I think this is even chop suey definitely is an essential form of that. And most of the, the Chinese food are cooked this way and which distinguishes Chinese food from Japanese food. Even though boiling and the steaming were the earlier forms of Chinese cooking. But then from third century on, and even the Tang Dynasty, stir frying was not so uh, important. What well, was not the only or the most important cooking style. But from the Song Dynasty on, when we see those texts, from like a Meng Liang Lu and, and so on. And then, you, that, that, then you can see a lot of chow. chow. Chop sui actually started with chow chop sui, right? So the chow, chow means, of course, stir frying or saute. And this became now the quintessential kind of way of cooking Chinese food, whether you agree or not. No, you are the expert. No, 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 no. <laughs> so. okay. There's a, yeah, there's yeah. a what I want to say is, I think uh, Chinese food for me is the salty. Uh, salty. There's a level of salty. Oh, it's it's not as bland as no, you know, what? No. no, not bland. Salty. <laughs> salty. And then we have, each of us have an individual uh, palate taste that we gravitate towards right. one palate taste over another. But no matter you know where you go, you try to go, go for that that uh, 
segment in your uh, picking your food or your dishes or your, oh, this is too salty or this is too sweet or something of that nature? Okay. Sorry. Um, this actually is um, becoming very interesting, is like what is Chinese food, because in that survey, remember I say, well, if you have to choose one from below, do you think American Chinese food is American or Chinese? Surprising, most students would pick this is American food. Surprisingly, all the, my colleagues, the first generation from China, they hesitated well, would say, yes, I accept it's Chinese food. Um, it is. You know, uh, it, it, as says, you know, the tourist group, and when they come to China, they accept that this is better than, you know, they would uh, recognize it. Um, is it Panda Express? Sure, it's better than, see, I do not know about the stir fry, it's high temperature. This is uh, the, the good restaurant food, and I can never reproduce it at home. I hate that oily smell. So for me, Panda uh, Express, did a better job than I would. And that's why I came to California and said, well, you know, this is decent. I would, ex you know, I, when I miss, you know, the food, I, I, I would choose this. Um, my, 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 my personal time is worse. And then salty food, we have Swiss too. I mean, the, the cu cuisine is a whole set, but then that is the, the, the promotional image you have. Well, also, I think there's also the conception of what is Chinese food in America, uh, again, Chinese, is we really are most familiar with uh, coastal Cantonese, and uh, that's really it. And it's only in recent years that we began to have begun to have more um, immigration from the rest of China. Uh, first, it was Taiwan, uh, and then we started to have people like from uh, that we started to cook Shang uh, 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 Sichuan Chinese food. But if you get out of that area, for example, your area uh, Shanghai uh, up in the north, it's not that sweet or is not as much stir fry. You have a lot of steamed food. Yes. You have a lot of braised foods. Mm -hmm. And again, this is all going to be slowly uh, going to get at more and more on Americans' radars, mm -hmm. especially in areas where there are large Asian populations. For example, the Bay Area, uh, San Gabriel Valley in Los Angeles, and Flatbush in New York, uh, where you have people from all over China that are bringing foods from their homeland and opening up restaurants. Now, that being said, we are still only experiencing uh, basically street foods here uh, and some home style cooking. Mm -hmm. We're not getting the great foods of China here yet. None of us are ever going to eat here in any restaurant a, a great dish that's in the Soya Shudan or something like that, you know, that, that, that you would think of as classic Chinese cooking outside of some really good Cantonese restaurants that will serve more of the high end things like for banquets, you know, for weddings or funerals or whatever. Um, and that's one thing that I miss that we ha don't have here are the great foods of China. That will have to slowly uh, get ramp up. And it's all sophistication on the part of the diner. They have to demand this food. I remember when I was growing up um, in the 60s and Julia Child came on television. Mm -hmm. And we all started to learn about French food. And the height of sophistication in the early 70s were, were crepe restaurants, going in and having crepes. Mm -hmm. Now, crepes is not a big thing. You know, they're jianbing, mm -hmm. right? And then you have sauces on them. But it was, to me, that was <laughs> absolutely incredible. Because we were having, yeah, it was like, oh, I've been eating like Julia Child. You know, I'm having ratatouille, and I'm having a crepe. And that was like, wow, I have really kicked off my job. I'm having authentic French food. Of course it wasn't authentic, but to me it was. And I think that's what we are now at this level with the foods of China. Where we're beginning to get this glimpse of what is there, but it, it will uh, demand sophistication on the part of diners to go into restaurants and say, uh, I want to have uh, Dong Po Ro, you know, uh, the Dong Po style pork, a braised pork, and to have it really made with uh, a good, um, uh, like a, a, uh, a good farm raised pork. That is the most important thing is having a good quality pork and really good Shaoxing wine and really good soy sauce and using rock sugar and ginger and something that's braised by somebody who knows what they're doing. And when you get something like that and you eat it, it's an absolute revelation because um, when you're talking about opening up the eyes to another culture, I don't think you can get it through Panda Express. Mm -hmm. uh, bless mm -hmm. their hearts, you know, they do, a, they do a good job. I mean, it's good fast food. It's like McDonald's or anybody else. They do a good fast food, but it's not really 
aiming at the heart of the culture. You're not having food that is going to open up your mind and your soul and say, there is an incredible food culture out there that I need to learn about. And so this, again, we are going to learn, we're going to ramp up. And as people go to China and eat and actually stay in China or Taiwan or Hong Kong and actually eat the foods that are truly reflective of the culture and the civilization of China, they're going to come back and demand it and say, I want to eat these foods. It's like what's happening with Japanese food here, with Korean food here. You'll see, like, you go to, to Los Angeles or to Flatbush or to the Bay Area, and you can have great Korean food. Again, it's still not banquet level, but it's really good homestyle cooking. And we're going to get up there gradually, mm -hmm. like what we're doing with French and Italian at this point, where we really have the great foods. And, and or, or you're going to have great Japanese food here, too. Because you go to Nobu, and you're paying $500 for a meal. It better be pretty good, mm -hmm. right? You go to, it's like going to French Laundry. You know, It's going to be pretty darn good. Because people really have spent time. These are masters of what they do. Do we have masters here yet? I don't know. I don't know. So that's you. one thing we need to <laughs> do. <laughs> I yeah. I've got the scars, but I don't have those. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. I'm very impressed with what you guys started, and and let me say one more contextualizing. So, uh, Professor Brian already has uh, presented a wonderful lecture Wednesday two days ago, and we start to uh, argue already. <laughs> and, and that's good because what I'm telling you. Two Cantonese, right? So this, you know, <laughs> that's why I'm going to say that because I hear you guys are all looking at this from a very intellectual and very experienced term. But then you try to define food from historical origin, object, ingredients, things, all these, they are wonderful. But then I feel, even though it's mentioned quite indirectly quite a few times, it's the skill and, and the performance because you can have the same meat, same, same the rock sugar, but if you give it to the hands of a poor chef or trainer, it can totally ruin. So that's why I've been arguing. We start the conversation. That, uh, Good. that didn't mind consciously Miranda now. So I would really think that we really have to define approach this issue of food and food culture, not only from the perspective of history and object, but also from the perspective of performance. Mm -hmm. So if food is, we have to look at, see how food, we approach it from a performance. In the beginning, it's how to cook. It's because how to cook makes the food, it's not just what ingredients. And then you can broaden it out with the performance of eating because uh, Professor Wong was saying that, you know, how do you set up the dishes, utensils? Because if you cook a good dong bong chicken or something, but you put it on, serve it a uh, good French plate and the dishes and beautiful uh, <laughs> red wood color and life and fog now. I'm sure people say that somehow it's less Chinese, mm -hmm. but maybe the taste is already very good. So I think the, the criteria Performance should be brought into our dialogue. That, that's what I'm saying. So may I, may I just yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the other Cantonese, um, right? Um, and my mother is coming through right now. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what if we try? And, and I don't want to talk about object as a static thing because, no. like, let's. So my sort of drift here, and, and David's my PSI. So you know, please forgive me for repeating myself. I'm getting old. Yeah. Um, what if we think of food cultures as like? You know, like living beings, even dishes could be like, you know, biological entities um, that over generations mutate and are in adaptations and new influences and new mixtures and that we don't think of food as a static object, but it's like, you know, it's, a, it's like a biological being, right? Um, and, you know, maybe that's one way of looking at, you know, sort of like, and also skills have to be passed down from one generation to the next. I don't cook exactly like my mother, though I try, right? Yeah. Right, or, and that can happen even without the sort of, you know, I'm mixed, so I have obviously some identity issues I'm already there. But just, you know, even inside of China, right? I mean, from one generation to the next, skills change, right? With new technology, amount of time, also just <coughs> random things that people do. They have their quirks, right, which they pass on. So if we think of it not as an object, but as beings, as, you know, biological entities, maybe that changes the way you look at mm -hmm. um, cuisines. Um, it also opens up a chance, yes? I'd like to just say um, about passing on food knowledge is, one thing that I'm very concerned about uh, is the uh, the lack of uh, traditional food knowledge that's being passed down in China, because there was a big disruption at the uh, at the end of the Civil War. 
uh, the communists took over, and really restaurants were outlawed by the 19 by 1968, and so there was a great disruption of the the grand tradition as you have in France or in, in Italy, where you have a master and a, an apprentice. It's handing down uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of years of knowledge, and it disappeared. And if you went to China, for example, in the early 80s, you did not eat well. 90s. Yeah, 90s. <laughs> but in Taiwan, it was preserved to a certain extent. Um, however, going back to Taiwan, I'm not eating as well as I did in the 80s. Um, the hand of the master is lost. The food knowledge is lost. And I'm extremely concerned that China's ancient, ancient food culture will disappear because what we're missing is food memory. Um, and that's why this guy, my, my cute little husband over here, um, he, ma he remembers what things taste like. And so I'll make something f and he'll say it needs more vinegar or it needs less salt or something. And he'll tweak it and he'll get it absolutely right and it'll just hit all of those little sensors correctly and the brain goes, yes, that's it. And that's what I, I'm always asking people, if you know older Chinese people, get their recipes down before they die. <laughs> and I'm not kidding, because this is extremely important. Um, I was talking to uh, a young man who said um, he wanted to make the Suzhou style uh, smoked fish. Uh, uh, right? And he said, um, I went to my aunt in, in Suzhou and, and she made it. You know? And I said, how do you make it? She goes, oh, it's just this, 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 this. <laughs> and he says, and I couldn't recreate it. So I told him how to make it. And he says, oh, exactly, that's it. It's these little secrets that you have to you memorize. Right, and you have to write them down, and you have to tell people, don't keep it in your little wallet and not tell everybody how to make it. I hate that when people don't tell you secrets, because it's just food, okay? But it's also your culture and it's shared culture. And so if we share our culture and we, we keep our Chinese culture alive, I, I can say our because I'm a Chinese daughter-in-law, um, but, um, you know, guilt by association or, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, if you can get this, these, these foods down and preserve them, from being lost in, in, in time. Uh, this is probably one of the most vital things we can do at this point because in another generation, it'll be all gone. Mm. But, but that's why we now are very thick into the theory of intangible culture, ICH. I can't hear you, sir. That's why we're very big right, into right. the theories of intangible culture. Intangible. Culture. Intangible culture heritage. Mm. And China is making food mm. in some kind of food as uh, Masterpiece of intangible culture, the young chop chow fan. They're trying to brand it as a yeah, they, they're, they're food yes, memory. Yeah. Actually. A very popular TV series, right? Bite of China, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And now it has the third season, I think. Yeah. 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 So they, they are, they're also trying to to present, but not just uh, the, the the high scale, uh, uh, high mm -hmm. culture in a way, but also the popular dishes that uh, everybody eats. Right. Right? And, and so also, that, that's uh, I think Caroline, you, Caroline, you just pin out one very important point is. A lot of these things is memory and sense, especially sensory memory. So if you don't have a memory of how the Chinese food should taste, it is very difficult to talk about. You can have all the recipes, right. but if you've never tasted a good xun yu, uh -huh. you really don't know what you're talking about. You can read all the recipes. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm getting my, my punch point, is that you have to have this kind of performance and memory. Absolutely, and that's, uh, I was just telling you uh, earlier, we, I went to the Sichuan uh, this last year and uh, was judging a uh, contest by these young chefs who were making Western style cooking. Uh, and the foods were good. I mean, they, the kids kids did a good job, but it was all off, just off <laughs> a little bit, you know? And so I, I went to the head teacher there and I said, how often do you take these kids out to eat Western food? And he said, what? And I said, well, if they can't, if they don't know how to eat it, how do they create it? Mm -hmm. If they don't know what a uh, beef bourguignon tastes like, they cannot create a beef bourguignon. Yeah. If you describe um, a Matisse to somebody and then say, now go paint it, they're not going to paint you a Matisse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if they look at the Matisse, if they listen to Mozart, maybe they'll be able to give you a, a few bars. You know, mm -hmm. they maybe they'll do a little sketch like a Matisse. But the person has to train the palate first. They have to learn what is good food, what is good wine. And Chinese wines are incredible too. And they should be recovered. The great vinegars of China should be recovered. If they're just the equal of anything that Italy can create, why aren't we having those, you know? So these are all the things I would like to have the, 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 um, the attention to taste memory, 
uh, developed as an education and also an attention to ingredients, core ingredients for the, for the foods of China. Oh, professors, uh, I just wonder, I'm from Taiwan, I'm from Taiwan, do you know Pei Mei, Fu Pei Mei? Of course, oh, yeah. of course. Okay, so I think she is uh, almost like uh, Julia Charles uh, mm -hmm. from East, because uh, she was so popular, she received uh, all the awards from Japan, Korea, all those uh, countries. And also, uh, she also revolutionized uh, Chinese uh, cooking or dishes uh, Taiwan because before her, we don't pay attention to appearance, American like you know pretty dish mm -hmm. advertising, and because of her she uh, she really I was a, she really, uh, really master of the Chinese. Yeah, Wei Chen also has a huge presence in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Has had one yeah, for a long time. Yeah. And she also looked at all of China rather than just right. one area. Um. Now also her dishes uh, today's standard probably not healthy because she always. Uh, Last the right food is, has all your spread, you know, <laughs> very oil. But uh, I think she, if she alive, she probably going to make. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I think uh, you have a comment. Uh, yeah, I, I, that's, that's a great segue for my question. Uh, we've talked about the food, we've talked about the taste. I'd like to hear more about the chefs, <laughs> and particularly when we think about this. Uh, well, for all Carol's to sort of extend what she said, Carol about the foods of China, perhaps the foods of China in America, we might say, who are the, who are the, what are the voices mm -hmm. of the people who produce these foods? And how can we uh, integrate those voices into narratives? Besides Fu Pei Mei, who operates on a very grand scale, I wonder how we can get uh, smaller voices in there. And, and do we treat this uh, as an anonymous cuisine? I can see the benefits of doing that, because then we don't get hung up on saying this person is a spokesperson for, for food in, for Chinese food in America. Uh, but at the same time, there's, there's a feeling that I, I want to hear from the folks that are producing it. So I want to ask this mm -hmm. panel of, of, of scholars who've worked on this subject to uh, perhaps reflect on the vo voices that they brought in, in their research and talk a little bit about that, how uh, going forward, if we're going to write about more about the foods of China in America, uh, what voices should we be looking for? Well, um, there are some very good uh, chef writers out there, like Ken Hong. Uh, he's based based in um, basically in uh, Europe, in, in England. Uh, he had a very bad experience here. He was like Oscar Peterson, you know, with with jazz. You know, he had to go overseas to be recognized. Mm -hmm. uh, but he has uh, restaurants all over the world. He would be a wonderful person to invite to this, and I'd, I'd be happy to to help you contact him. Um, Grace Young, uh, people that are good writers about Chinese cooking. Uh, if you're talking about chef writers, there are very few. Uh, as, for, as far as famous Chinese chefs in America, there's not enough. Um, Ming, right? Ming, somebody yeah, Ming. Ming Tai. Yeah, Ming but Tai. But he's, like, he's it's, more it's not, fusion. It's not fusion. Yeah, fusion. Not fusion. Um, and he's a wonderful uh, how, how about How about the, the, the famous person in Chow, the Chow restaurant? Martin Yeah, Martin. Yeah, yeah. Martin. yeah. No, 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 not Martin Yeah, in New York City. There's Chow, a Mr. Chow. Chow, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, been, I've been to the restaurant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that is considered like a high form of Chinese food, at least. It's a high yeah. form of Chinese American food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it is. It's, it is Chinese American then, food. Then, then in Philadelphia, there's a Susanna Fu. The, the Susanna Fu also, also, also has a. Close, yeah, yeah she, she's, a, she's originally from Taiwan, and, but I think it is closed down now. Yeah. I, I actually yeah. ate there, and they actually serve with Chinese food and silver, real silver silverware. This guy in Philly, that the, uh, he has, he owns a chain called Han Dynasty. He's the oh, the, the 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 Han Dynasty, yeah, also has one in. So is necessary. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 But that that was uh, that was not as uh, you know. Yeah, I think that was an excellent idea. Yeah. 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 Uh, I just push the panelists to think beyond these famous people. Mm -hmm. I, I want to know, you know, where where are we? I've got cousins who own yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because, uh, because uh, we're, I think that's really important because those people are our folks people for Chinese food but Again, America, I guess we need to talk about, are we talking about Chinese American food or are we talking about Chinese food in America? Mm -hmm. That's my, I guess that's say what's the different. the foods of China in yeah. America. Okay, because that would be different because, I mean, we have some wonderful restaurants in the Bay Area. I, yeah. I mean, we could, we'd be happy to talk to the chefs there that we love, you know, that we go to. For example, um, there's a wonderful uh, Muslim Chinese restaurant in Milpitas where the, the, mm -hmm. the chef is from Gansu. 
and he is a Muslim, and he buys halal, and that's the kind of person that might be able to talk, but is it Chinese-American food? No, again, it's Chinese food in America. It's, it's authentic. Uh, although the, a lot of the, the Pakistani people there eat sweet and sour chicken, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. But uh, we could get other people, you know, that like cook uh, authentic dim sum, uh, that could come in and talk, maybe. But again, they would be not speaking in English, they would be speaking in Chinese, you'd have to have interpreters ready. Well, you have this Japanese, I mean, whether he's American or not, Morimoto. In Iron Chef America, Morimut has one in, in New York City and also has one in Philadelphia, which is very high priced and um, with the best uh, presentation of the Japanese food. And he does not speak uh, English, and, but he's, he's always, I mean, uh, not always, but uh, often the champion in the Iron, uh, Iron Chef America oh, yeah, sure. TV shows. That, that decoration is terrible. Of a restaurant. <laughs> okay. Um, it, that's a, um, it's the, that question is uh, reveals one of the, one of the um, um, uh, I don't want to use the word uh, weakness, but one of the characteristics of uh, the food of China in the U.S. Okay, um, it also reveals its, its status, okay, which is the lack of uh, voice. Mm -hmm. Right, it has remained uh, anonymous, invisible, just like uh, Chinese I immigrants, how how they were treated in the past. I mean, it's you know. Uh, it, it, it's a statistic, okay, uh, John Chinaman, or when they had a name. Okay. So, uh, but I want to go back to, to Carmen's uh, early um, uh, uh, and good point about the pa you know, the, about food as, as, as past, uh, as a tra uh, tradition. As a historian, I'm not supposed to say this, uh, because I only agree with uh, that good comment, 80%. Uh, because I also want to uh, uh, remind us of the danger of uh, over glorifying, uh, uh, glorifying um, the the culinary past of any cuisine. Uh, uh, cuisine is a, a biological living entity. Right? It evolves constantly. So I mean, the, it, it is a tradition, and the past is very important. But on the other hand, food. To study a cuisine is not just about the past, it's also about the future. Mm -hmm. So whenever I work with someone who wants to open a restaurant, especially a Chinese restaurant, you know, I, I, my advice is not to go to the past, but, also, but more importantly to look into the future. Right? Uh, fusion, you know, drive throughs you know, those are, you know, uh, are some of the things that we have to think about. I would respectfully disagree. Um, I, I think that this is like art, it's like any kind of painting. You can do a Jackson Pollock, but unless you have drawn a figure and you know how to draw a figure well, you cannot paint a Jackson Pollock. Uh, you have to have the bones of your culture down. And for example, uh, I see too many um, white chefs going to Japan or to Korea or even now more and more to, to China, and they bring back images of what they mm -hmm. think the food is like, and then they put it in the food, and, it, and to me, it's, it's, a, um, it's, it's like, uh, it's dilution of a culture, it's dilution of a food. And I, what I would like to see is more uh, people in China taking their food seriously. Uh, we go to, for example, we go to Chengdu, and we don't get classic Sichuan food anywhere. It's all the same thing. It's all mala you know, hot pot. <laughs> and numbing a uh, hot pot, um, or, or it's a, it, it's all the chuan chuan xiang, it's all mm -hmm. the same thing, everybody has the same thing. We're, and then I, we went to uh, meet with uh, an old chef's association, it was just, just old, old guys that used to work in the kitchens, so, you know, there was one guy that used to work, for the cook from Mao Zedong, I mean, that's how old they were. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I said to them, you know, I read old Sichuanese cookbooks, and they're not all hot and numbing. We have this misconception that Sichuanese food is hot and numbing. It's not. That's more uh, street food. It's uh, some areas of China, uh, of Sichuan, do have hot and numbing, but not everybody. And I said, is, is that a misconception on that point? Am I reading this wrong? Mm -hmm. And they said, no. Our food was not hot and spicy all the time. It's just that now people want it. They want the fireworks. Mm -hmm. And so we go to Taiwan now to eat, and it's Sichuanese food everywhere, yeah. but it's not the classic Sichuanese food is fireworks. It's hot and numbing, you know? 
because it is fun, you know, to eat something that just blows up your your palate, you know, and then after <laughs> three bites, you're you're done, you know. But um, so I guess my point is that I would like to see more of a renaissance of of Chinese cooking, where uh, people in every part of China take their cuisine seriously and go back and get the old cookbooks and get the old guys that used to cook in the kitchens. They get the grandmas and then dig out these old recipes. How do you make great uh, dofu cheese, you know, dofu roll? How do you make the great wines? What's the secrets there? You go to a place like Shanxi where the vinegar was supposed to be so good that you could drink it by the ladleful. I don't see that anywhere else. Where is it? We used to have a wonderful vinegar in uh, Danshui, which is a port inside of uh, Taipei. And there was one restaurant, it was a window restaurant, a uh, 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 style restaurant. And they had this vinegar that was to die for. It was like a Modena bas balsamic, mm -hmm. but on steroids. And we would get it like a roast chicken. I'm getting, I'm getting all goosebumpy here because it was just so good. <laughs> and we would just, I would just pour it over everything. And it was just so delicious. And I said, where, do you, where can I buy this? <coughs> and he says, oh, my friend makes it up in Gaoxiong. But it's like these people, these, these are artisans. And I would like to see an artisanal movement in China where people respect the land, respect the animal, respect the grain, and they start creating these great ingredients. And it's not lost because, yes, we can have fusion food, and there's nothing wrong with fusion food. I'm, I'm totally on board with fusion food. But we can't at the same time let go of the past. We can paint abstract paintings, but at the same time, we have to be able to draw the human figure, mm -hmm. like Michelangelo. That's my passion. Get excited <laughs> <laughs> a conference without a debate is like having a bland mi uh, meal without uh, spicy stuff. Right? <laughs> so, um, <Chili> <laughs> the, uh, you know, the uh, so if you, the past is very important. Yeah, but uh, but how far do you want to go? You know, right? if you go back in in Sichuan province, go back to an earlier than Ming Dynasty. You know, there's no then there's no uh, 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 chili peppers, right? So. Uh, again, you know the uh, you know the, the past. You know, while respecting the past, we need to uh, to to be uh, aware of uh, the danger of uh, over glorifying. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't. You know, uh, I love my mother's good cooking, but I don't like to eat my grandmother's cooking, <laughs> which, which was more 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 bland. So there is that sort of a um, biological part of it. Uh, there's a comment over there. So <laughs> Can you speak a little louder? Um, um, there is often a judgment. Please don't direct me to any distractions. Okay. There must be you. I've been getting hand signals. But um, yeah, the, there is a grand variety. And some people treasure the old and would like to stick with the old and bring back the old and the parents. But also other things happen at that time, too. You're, make, you're making selections. And it, I'm going to jump this because so much came into it. You can do a, a palette type painting. You wouldn't do a palette without doing and not without doing that, what did you call it, figures, first figure drawing, that sort of thing. The same with Picasso. I mean, we can just discard. You can say, yes, yeah, I'm a purist. The person who studies knows he did this, he did this, and this. I'm old enough to know I was around when Picasso was still alive. And when he was drawing those doves on the potter's wheel and selling them, those doves turned off. He knew darn well he was making puff doves and people were buying them because of his pain with the proceeding, and which had gone back to figure drawing and that was. But that's an elitist view of the art. Some people just appreciated that dove at the end and they have no idea what it was before. Mm -hmm. And the same with the food, the stuff that's evolving. There will be people in generations now that will harken back to the fond taste and flavor and smell as they walk by a Panda Express. As they came back to the <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's gonna happen. It doesn't matter if you go up to a few right here on our North Campus, walk by that one. It doesn't work so well in the mm -hmm. in down at the union, but go in that door, you open the door, and that says Kripak Commons to people, the smell of the vinegar and the spices from the Panda Express. Same thing happened back up there when a McDonald's was up there. There were people who have fond memories because you walked in the door, they had the same place that now has the Panda Express. It smelled of McDonald's. And if you smell french fries from McDonald's in the library on North Campus, Many people say, oh my God, it's McDonald's. I have all these great feelings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that, that's actually. And I think they're having the same feeling that someone who really appreciates the front and is fond of a uh, historical dish from their memories and from taste of their and an educated palate, they're having the same experience. Well, that's the difference, though, really, between nostalgia and, mm -hmm. um, and, and an appreciation for classicism. 
Um, and, and so uh, nostalgia is one thing, and there's nothing wrong with nostalgia. Uh, uh, I, I miss the foods that I ate in Taiwan in the 70s, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, but again, my, my feeling is just really, uh, well, fusion and modernity is, is good, and there's nothing, we shouldn't stand in the way of progress. At the same time, you have to have an appreciation for history oh, and mm -hmm. for knowledge, uh, especially in the field of food, because food tends to be, um, considered a craft rather than a knowledge. And I'd, I'd like to elevate the, <coughs> the understanding of world cuisines, especially something that is as powerful and as ancient as China's cuisines to a level of knowledge rather than simple craft. Mm -hmm. uh, because for so long it's been in the hands of, uh, of chefs. And chefs in China, traditionally just like in Europe, were not people who were educated in school. Mm -hmm. They were, it's like, um, Jean Papin, you know, his, his father, I think at the age of eight, took him down to the chef and said, I want my son to be apprenticed. And there's nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, he's a very intelligent man and he also read. And so he was reading the great, you know, uh, Paul Bocou, you know, he, was, he, was, he would go in and study with him and learn from them. So as food scholars, though, I think we have to approach it from a different direction. And we have to understand that there is this amazing foundation mm -hmm. and that we are up here, and the ocean has this little tiny peak here that we can see, but underneath is this massive, massive structure that we have to go down in and look into and investigate and study and really appreciate because as far as I'm concerned, Chinese cuisines, if it's not, if not the best, it is one of maybe the two or three best in the world. My vote, the best. Okay, no question about it. It's just so grand and so old I mean, you go and you look at recipes from the Zhou Dynasty, for crime's sakes. I mean, my people, my ancestors were living in caves, all right? Okay. <laughs> so, you know, you, you really, you look at this and it, it is so grand and so ancient, and we have to be respectful of it. And I think it's just having respect for the culture of China, the classical culture of China that is so vitally uh, important and to this field. And the treasures of that food. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't think I'm dismissing that at all. I think what happens with part of the restaurant issue is, I'll go with the kind of express, but maybe I haven't been doing for a while. We've got a lot of things because it's been brought up and it's been around here. Is the economics of it, the fine dishes that you're talking about, as much as, um, as much as there is also the expense of the, of the materials used, let's talk, we're talking craft, there's also the expense of the time exerted to provide that food. And I think that's that's one of the concerns that we should think after we have, you know, if we go to an extreme, say, the historical mm -hmm. restaurant that's set up as a historical Chinese food restaurant. No, but you're talking about fast right food versus fine Chinese cooking, and then that, that's two different oh. fields. I'm sorry, go ahead. As far as restaurants, it's not. <laughs> there are two different issues. I just want to put, put, put a footnote to this debate, which is very fascinating, and I want to broaden it. These are the same issues exactly going on for quench, which is supposed to be the most classical element genre, literature, and theater. Mm -hmm. So then mm -hmm. one, on one side, some people, this is so good, we really have to study and try to preserve it. But then there's another few gang of people, or the, di the other dimension is say that, but the best of Chinese people now, they are not living in Ming Dynasty of uh, gardens. They don't have five hours to eat one meal. They eat it snap three minutes. So they are asking exactly the same question. How do you preserve the classical tradition which by any means is as high as people, humanity has produced. But at the same time, the modern life, how do you well, reconstruct the glory? Yeah. How do you balance the past and the future? So okay. the, the Chinese, the Confucian, the country way of talking this, and because that's my big uh, research project this year, is Liang Tiao Tui Zhou Lu. Two feet. Uh, two, two feet. One going to the past, one going to the future. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> 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 I think the things also come to fall down. One is the sort of food and now we, we're eating. Yeah. And now we know. Mm -hmm. And the other one is uh, the Chinese food. Mm -hmm. Just Chinese like, uh, let, let, let me uh, off this uh, subject. I give you an example. We study the modern literature or the ancient literature. Yeah. But literature is one. If you study modern literature, you don't read uh, Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Is not correct? Yeah, yeah. It's right. Correct. So now they are talking two subjects. And the one is in the McDonald's 
that's in the restaurant and in Chinese restaurant. They are doing business. Whatever they can earn money, they do it. Whatever they feed your uh, pellets, they do it because they can sell. But we talked about the food. That's the history and the culture. But if you really want to understand the Chinese food, you have to understand the past. Mm. Otherwise, you lose your DNA of Chinese food. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And that's my question. Yeah. I hope that everyone, I, I tossed my, 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 uh, my, side, my question. So what's the definition of a Chinese food? Mm -hmm. Let's figure out what's the Chinese food. And then we talk about the, the food in restaurant. And then we talk about the fusion Chinese food. And whatever fusion Chinese food, I tell you honestly, they have to change. They fit the, the, the temporary requirement because they are doing business. Okay, now, now I know this, I, I totally understand. Yeah, we you. talk about two subjects no, now. No, I'm not so sure I agree with yeah. you. Yeah, but, but let me give you a wonderful thing. Again, from my experience with Quan Chi, that the issue of art history versus money. And I'm the kind of new uh, musicologist. I don't mind talking about music and money. So I give you that because you need money to make music. Tremendous yeah. amount. So yeah. I give you the term. If you say Confucianism, Chinese art culture, and then versus business, uh, mm -hmm. in a way there are two separate levels, but they are linked. So I'll give you the term. Wu Shang, Wu Shang, the Confucian merge. So they are these Chinese musicians. The merchant business people, they do great business. They make money. That is their first job. But at the same time, they do also have a mission of keeping, transmitting the culture. That's why they call Confucian business. Mm -hmm. So can we have both and put these con conflicting impulses into our dialogue? And that, that's why I find this is Fantastic when we going to take clothes <laughs> <laughs> I think that is uh, like I'm first of all I'm very moved by Carolyn's uh, you know just passion and also <laughs> the yeah uh, and then this uh, sense of urgency that we're losing a great uh, uh, you know culinary culture that is going to be forgotten you know in a generation or two I totally understand what it means and, and then uh, I think the the reason for the, you know, although this is s great culture, how, how come it's going to be lost? If it's a great culture, how come no one's appreciated it? So this, I think uh, it comes uh, essentially to how do we popularize the concept of the ch Chinese food culture, what is good food. However, the answer for food is li does not always lie in food. Just think about, uh, for all of you, how do you, for example, uh, imagine and how did where did you get the sense of, for example, the old French cooking or um, Japanese cooking? Is that from uh, only from food? Is it from TV shows, from popular culture images, from how people talk about things? And for the young generation, from like an uh, Japanese animations, you know, they, they said, "Wow, the, the admir admiration of culture it all come in one package." The, the, the interesting and also fascinating thing about Chinese uh, cuisine nowadays is although China has a glorious past, the Chinese society today is embracing um, the globalization, the modern thing, and then this is a generation who has a technique and a skill to popularize the Chinese mm -hmm. art cuisine, uh, the art. However, they're not interested in the same culture, in the same past that you are interested in. So, for example, grandma's cooking, you know, fascinating, but different grandmas have different ways of cooking, and they do not necessarily like each other's recipe, <laughs> right? So it's not standardized, it's not standardized, it's not like uh, when we're talking about today's food culture and how we perceive, like, from popular shows like Iron Chef and things like this, and that is an you know, a good way of popularizing food culture, but that's not the way that suits the traditional way of cooking, which it was individualized and uh, it takes time, it belongs to a lifestyle when, you know, you spend hours mm -hmm. cooking or waiting for the food to be cooked. And it's very hard 
to sell it in the modern media mm -hmm. and uh, in the modern language, especially because even in within China themselves, they you know in that culture itself now is everyone's looking forward to standardization, to mass production, to quality control rather than you know appreciating mm -hmm. uh, that kind of uh, distinctiveness of each individual recipe. Well, I yeah. think also it also goes to the uh, idea of having confidence mm -hmm. um, in your food. Uh, you go to Nobu or you go to Bolo, uh, a, a French or a Japanese restaurant like that, um, you will not be offered a, a dumbed down menu. Mm. You will be offered what the chef feels is representative of his cuisine and of mm -hmm. his art. And it's, that's why, it's why you go to, or French Laundry or any of these places, you are eating food that is considered extremely good. Mm -hmm. It is considered the, ape the apex mm -hmm. of their cuisine. And I would like to see Chinese chefs do the same thing. Where there's no BS. You go in there, and this is what I'm offering. This is a set meal. Like we went to Yujilan in, in Chengdu. It's a, I don't know if you've ever been there, but if you go to Chengdu, you should go to this place. It's, it's a wonderful little restaurant. The entire restaurant is probably the half the size of this. It's a little galley kitchen, and um, y it's, it's, a, it's like a home. And you sit down, and the chef has prepared meals. The dishes match the meals. Uh, every dish has its own particular ceramic uh, container. And it's prepared with confidence and with pride. Mm -hmm. And to me, I, that is what I'd like to see. I would like to see pride and confidence in, the, in, in chefs where a chef stands up and says, this is what I cook, mm. this is what I'm good at, and if you don't like it, go somewhere else. You go to Novo or you go into any good sushi restaurant, mm -hmm. you better not put the soy sauce and, and the wasabi together and dip your sashimi with the right side down. You're gonna get kicked out on your ear, okay? <laughs> you're not gonna be asking for, can I have a hot dog, all right? <laughs> no, you're gonna be getting the really, the something that's really fine, and they're gonna watch what you order and they're going to serve you accordingly, all right? They're going to see, do you know what you're eating? Can you appreciate it? Are, am I feeding you pig's ears or am I feeding you pearls, you know? It all depends upon how you order. And I think that is something that we have to, uh, as, as people who, are, who love Chinese, Chinese foods, is that we have to encourage our chefs to be out there, to, to really to, we have to fund them and to give them the kind of like a palace where they can offer the best food in the world to people with discriminating palates. I'm sorry, you're going to say that. Yeah. Um, what? I'm sorry. Oh, oh, okay. I'm the odd man now, but I'm going to say that because of the music college, these questions exactly are the same with music. You see, a lot of Chinese people, they're forcing their kids to learn music, but it's always piano and violin. Uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> that's why it's a, it's a historical post colonial uh -huh. heritage. Chinese people don't have confidence in their music. So when they say music, they have to learn better. So in order for, like you, I think like in order for Chinese people, food culture to have this renaissance, we really have to come up with the ground up. Uh -huh. So to make yeah. the conservatories to start teaching Chinese music say this is as good as Beethoven. Right. Otherwise, everyone coming out from them, the heart is right on Chinese, I want for more Chinese, but they always dumb it down and make it into okay. So, So I'm just so fascinated to see all this power. So, I mean, th how many people know Chinese music? Right. 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 That's right. Is right. The, but Chinese culture music has a tremendous tradition of Chinese music. But because of the, we know the colonial ship and things. So that is a question with the, the, the power and the forces we're dealing with. So we, we look into it. So there are lots of things to do. So I, I just already the music experience on this. Absolutely. Yeah, to, to me, I think that uh, what uh, uh, Kelly is saying is, is uh, making it really a contrast between, yeah. between <laughs> Chinese food in say overseas or you know outside of China and also Japanese food in uh, 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 in America because if you go to if you ask a Japanese uh, person how often he or she eats uh, sushi then the person will say that usually just once a month mm -hmm. so it's uh, so it was uh, hibachi is even rare because I've been to Japan several times and the one time I was in a five-star hotel then you have those chefs cooking in front of you 
but of course in America. So in other words, that uh, just like you are saying, that the Japanese present their best form or the highest form of their uh, uh, culinary uh, tradition. Uh, but in their daily life, of course, they use a lot of grilling and also stewing and so on. So that's it's uh, not so different from the the daily food in China. But I mean, I also agree with as a fellow historian uh, uh, with uh, Yong Chen's idea about there's a, a, a concept of historicity here. In terms of uh, Chinese food, of course, uh, the pepper was not introduced to, to China until the, the 16th century. So in other words, that uh, Sichuan food, what's the authentic Sichuan food? That's always a question. And uh, the other thing is, of course, uh, when we talk about uh, the, the, the flowering of uh, Chinese culinary tradition, well, not, we, we cannot go back to Tang Dynasty. You know, according to my uh, research, I think Tang Dynasty only has maybe two survived recipes. So the Han Dynasty can even have less. So that means the, the you have the flowering of recipes well basically in the Ming Dynasty and later in the Qing Dynasty. It's thanks actually to, in a way, it's, it's kind of paradoxical development. It's thanks to the blooming, I mean not blooming, the explosion of Chinese population, so therefore you have a lot of cheap laborers so they can prepare the food. So I think Yan's study about uh, Yuan Ming is, is very important because it was that time period, Ming and the Qing period, that you see suddenly a major kind of rise of recipes and so on. And the most of the, even the Xiaolongbao, you see, the Xiaolongbao really depend, uh, demands a lot of uh, customers yeah. who are waiting to eat. And also the way that, you know, Xiaolongbao, I mean, the, the, the Dao has to be semi-fermented. Yeah. Means that if you have the Dao there for like a, a, a day, then you cannot make Xiaolongbao anymore. So that means the semi-fermented. So it's like a waiting. So you have to, so this is a really high form, but that high form was helped by the explosion of Chinese population, because pop population in China, even in the Song Dynasty, had overpassed like 100 million. Then after the Mongol invasion, the Chinese population is, at the beginning of the Ming Dynasty was about 60 million. It's the Ming and the Qing Dynasty, thanks actually to the, the New World crops from America, the Chinese population really shut up. So that, that, that is because of the cheap labors and therefore the Chinese food are what we have seen today. So it was how to go back. That means we can only go back to the Ming and the Qing dynasties. If we go back to Tang dynasty, I think it, it, it's better for us to go to Japan to see maybe the original form of Chinese food. So in a, in a, in a way, that's, uh, that's, uh, that, that's what, what you're saying is really make a call on the food historians of China mm -hmm. to do more research. That is to find out the, the, the maybe not authentic, but at least the reveal the, the historicity of Chinese food in China. Well, on the other hand, the loss of some of the past may not be a bad thing. There may be something distinctive about Chinese culture. People live in the moment. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the past is lost. It has always been there. And in many aspects lost, but Chinese move on to the future. Maybe that is, yeah, you know, never know. When, yeah. I also love, um, I know you're, you're going to speak, uh, let me um, uh, wait, um, because I love the passion uh, coming from you. I think that heats up the, the room yeah. in this cold weather. Yeah. Uh, I mean, adds a lot of uh, uh, spice to the conversation. The, um, and also, I totally agree w w with you. Uh, I also believe that Chinese food in the, or food of China in the U.S. Uh, doesn't uh, have the, the respect, the recognition uh, it deserves. Okay. But with that said, uh, I want to go back to you know uh, what represents uh, the food of China. Okay. So I can think of many kinds. Okay. The kind of uh, uh, of say uh, a friend of mine in in, in Beijing uh, who once wanted to take me to. Uh, a restaurant called uh, Ai uh, Abanoni, Ai Bao uh, Bao Yu, where they serve uh, a kind of a, a abalone, uh, uh for like uh, close to six hundred U.S. dollars uh, per piece. Requires a uh, three years, a uh, uh, three days, not three years. Uh, thank God, it's not three years uh, uh, to prepare. Okay, or uh, the food of my mother back in the nineteen sixties and seventies, so when I was growing up. Uh, where she did not have in, even any access to to any uh, kind of a real seafood, uh, not to mention uh, abalone, okay, or uh, the food of uh, uh, migrant workers working in Shanghai, in in Beijing, making right now about you know, about uh, a few uh, uh, a few hundred dollars a month and spending about a hundred dollars 
a month for uh, for for their meals. So what which represents the food of China? 